Just smile for me and let the day begin. Hello YouTube, and I very unsuccessfully attempted to open this video um, with me singing my favorite love song of all time. Is it my favorite? It is really, really close. It's On the Wings of Love by Jeffrey Osborne. Because this video is going to be talking about love, um, but more importantly, it's going to be talking about self-love. Let's get into it. So this week, um, something that happened, a lot of things happened, and I want to say that um, I did not do my little very necessary show this week because, whoo, that is some work. The editing and the editing and the editing, and I don't know who I thought I was trying to turn around like three videos in a week. Um, I'm sure that's a thing that I could have done, but mm. I didn't want to. So I will be back with it next week for anybody who cares to watch it. Again, I really do it for my benefit because I don't put like who I'm talking about or whatever in the um, in the description. And a lot of times by the time I get around to talking about an issue, like the internet has forgotten about it, which brings me to what I'm gonna be talking about today. This week, um, two very, very unlikely adversaries from very different parts of the social media world came together and did a battle of sorts. Um, there was a very clear winner and um, I want to talk about what happened between these two women. I want to talk about what my take on each of their sides is. And then I want to give my distinct um, point of view in the whole situation because I don't think it's something that you hear on social media a lot. Okay, so I'm talking, of course, about Tabitha Brown and Wendy Williams. Earlier this week, Tabitha Brown, um, she who brought veganism to the eyes, homes, and hearts of so many people via her TikTok channel and her Instagram channel. I first found out about Tabitha Brown during the pandemic, like a lot of people. I think it was April of 2020. Everybody was locked in a house and confused, and someone reposted something that she she done where she says she likes to go outside with her smoothie and pretend like she's at a restaurant. Um, and then, you know, she did it in that soothing tone she has. Hello there. Well, that's my business. Like, so like that. All the sweet and like, you know, um, nurturing and soothing down home Southern way she has of saying things. All her little aphorisms and all that sort of thing that, that endeared her to the public and took her um, over the course of a year from just being a woman who had social media accounts and posted and did whatever to being a media mogul. She's now an actress. She's now got multiple brand deals. Tabitha Brown is a giant in the world of the internet and I don't know of any enemies that she has or anyone that does not like Tabitha. And then Wendy Williams announced her to be that person that I did not know this week. Well, I, she didn't say she didn't like Tabitha, but anyway, let's move on. So Tabitha, um, like I said, she had a really, really successful 2020 and she decided to talk about it um, online because since she had so much success, she is going to be retiring her husband. Um, she talked about how years ago they moved out to LA together. They didn't know anybody. And you know she wanted to be an actress and he was like, okay, I'll support you. And he got a job working as a police officer and he's been doing that for, she told him, it'll take me five years. It took 15 years and he stayed in there and he did what he had to do to support her. And now that she's the one that's making money and that's pulling in um, a salary, she's going to give him the opportunity to relax. She said a lot of wonderful things in this first Instagram post announcing this. Um, this is the thing she said though that really, really caught my attention and that caught Wendy Williams' attention too, apparently. But I also know that it's time for him to dream again. It's time for him to uh, think like a child and think, Ooh, when I grow up, what do I want to be? And it's something else. It's time for a new journey. So the idea of being able to become like a child again. I know me, I recently left a job that I've had for, um, or a career that I've had for the last 10 years because my own inner child was like, this isn't what I want to do. And um, I had to listen. So the idea that she's going to give this man who has been their family's sole solid provider um, for the last 15 years, she's going to give him the opportunity to say, okay, hey, I can go back to the things that really, really in inspire my spirit and make me feel connected to that inner child. And, um, you know, that's, that's just 
I don't want to call it um, a miracle of manifestation, so I'll call it a miracle of possibility because I think that there's a lot of people who have goals and dreams and things they want to do and they, they make all the lists and they put it out there in the universe. But if we're honest about the way life works out, everyone still does not get the ultimate opportunities that they wanted and they dreamed for. It's just not what happens in life. And I think Tabitha is great because she always acknowledges, oh, well, God blessed me. Well, I'm, I'm a blessed person. Like this is an amazing possibility that actually came true for me. So I think that's great. Somebody who did not think it was great was Wendy Williams. Um, Wendy Williams talked about Tabitha on her show. And the first thing, the first time that I knew she was going to be disrespectful was when she said, I don't know this woman because I don't follow social media like that. Now, come on now, in Wendy Williams' voice. If you've been on the internet, if you've been on TikTok, if you've been online in the last year, you know who this is. But it reminds me of things I used to say in high school when they would be like, do you know so-and-so? She been talking about you. And I'd be like, who? I know who that girl is. But anyway, so Wendy then starts to go into what Tabitha said about how she's gonna retire her husband. And when the audience was like, Wendy goes and she proceeds to basically talk about how, well, I just let her do it in her words. Nope. I was married to one of those. You know, I make the money and so on and so forth. Go live your dreams, buy a business, you know, stay with me, but go, go, go. You see how that turned out. <laughs> I predict that this marriage is gonna be on real rocky ground in a moment live your dream. Then they invest in stuff and they lose the money. And then they invest in something else and the money gets swindled or stolen. And then they invest again. Then he comes home and throws his bag down. And then he's like, and she's like, what? What? And he's like, I can't do this. And this is your fault. You know, you're over here making all your money and stuff. You had me quit my job and I can't find my live like a child. So clearly Wendy done been through a lot. She has some specific examples to point to why what Tabitha is doing for Chance is such a bad thing. And um, yeah, uh, her audience shut up about it real quick. They and her show kept moving on. Well, Tabitha has a lot, a lot, a lot of fans. They are called the Tabbage Patch <laughs> and uh, they let her know, hey girl, uh, Wendy was talking about you on her show and this is what she said. And so Tabitha responded and that set off this kind of like firestorm of events and reactions across social media. Because the way she responded was very sweet on the surface, but under that surface, was 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 uh, was was well, 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 Wendy better watch her mouth. That, that was that was that was that was the implication under the surface. That was the subtext of it. Also, um, what she said to Wendy was so interesting because uh, she basically ministered to her um, about the difference between the abusive relationship that Wendy was in and the loving, supportive. Um, uh, uplifting relationship that Tabitha has been in. And she let Wendy know, my husband and your husband are not the same person. And I hope that you are able to find this type of supportive, unconditional, um, patient, kind, sacrificing love that I've been able to find in my life because it's wonderful. And when you find that person who pours into you, you are going to see that it is a possibility and how beautiful and sweet love can really be. So Wendy did not respond. She hasn't responded to that yet. And I think Tabitha did that on like a Thursday. So Wendy could have responded on, on Friday or she could have said something, but she didn't. But I wanted to do a response because while I respect where Tabitha is coming from and while I 100% agree that if you have known one extreme, you need to know another extreme to get a big, big idea of what um, of what life is like and what the possibilities of life really are. I would have given Wendy different advice because my experience in love is different from Tabitha's. So before I go into the advice that I would have given Wendy, I wanna talk about um, just the two women similarities of from myself that I see in the two women. The first thing, Wendy, I have absolutely been there when you have been burned by a situation and there's somebody who is frolicking in the same type of situation that you that you recognize and they're having the time of their life but you got burnt. I feel this way anytime someone suggests 
interracial dating to me. While I believe that, you know, especially for black women, we should explore whomever loves us, whomever wants to be with us, whomever, because we deserve to find love and we don't have to code it as this or as that for it to be good. Um, I also know that no man is perfect just because of the color of his skin. So, and I myself have been in some situations with men of certain skin colors. And I know other women that have been in these situations. And so when people say, oh, well, <laughs> have you tried dating outside of your race? It's just like, it's, it's, everybody doesn't have the same experience. And so um, I say that to say this, when I do see though, when I do see, um, especially now, because, you know, like I said before, I'm 37. So like if I'll be shopping in the Target stores near my neighborhood, which when I was younger, I'd be the only black person in those stores. They didn't have any um, hair products for us. They didn't have it. Like we had to go downtown to get our hair products. We had to um, go downtown to see more people that look like us in the stores. Now I see us all over the stores. And I also see women who are about 10 years younger than me coming in with boys that look white boys that look like the kids that I went to high school with. And these, they're married. In fact, when I bought this hair oil the other day, uh, I was on the aisle with a black girl who looked exactly like me. She's married to this white guy that in high school, that same white guy, we, we had a conversation one time with the white boys in our high school because they were not dating black girls. And um, someone asked him, well, would you ever consider dating outside of your race? And he goes, yeah, if there were no more white girls here, but there are, so I won't. Hmm. And we were just like, man, like we, we were just so outdone by the whole thing. And, you know, so when I see little, I call them little girls, but younger women who look just like me, who are there with their white husbands, I know why they're there with them because they grew up with them. I, I'm At one point, I'm happy because I'm like, yes, like people finally started opening their minds up and young women are not having to grow up the same way that I did, you know, just kind of searching like, who, who, who. But at the same time, I'm very bitter because I'm just like, that was supposed to be me. I was, you know, I was the one who was a pioneer of this thing. I was supposed to be out here, you know, looking for hair products with my confused white husband. That man was confused, but it didn't happen to me. And so I recognize the windiness of it all, right? I, rec I recognize looking at a situation that should have turned out so much different. And yet you're here alone, filled with hurtful experiences and you're watching somebody else go through it and they look like they're having a great time. And the difference between me and Wendy is she can't even fathom someone finding happiness just because she didn't. Whereas me, on the other hand, I'm like, I couldn't do it. But go ahead, girl. All right. I'm not mad at you. Does he know what edge control is? Which one are y'all picking out? I need some help. What's going on? I got a pretty good edge control the other day, actually. I don't know where it is, but it's it's good. But yeah, so I recognize that in Wendy Williams. I also, I wanna say this about Tabitha. So I didn't realize when she was talking about coming out to LA, I was like, man, we really all do have the same story, don't we? Tabitha came out to LA. She's like, I had $8,000 saved. I had $6,000. She was like, we didn't know nobody. I didn't know nobody. Um, but the difference is, of course, she had Chase with her. And uh, she was like, you know, we got out there, we got an apartment. Also, they got out there in 2000, which LA, and I looked up this, uh, I looked this up a lot when I was out there because I was like, whoo, these apartments are so expensive. How are people, how are people living here? And the thing is, is anybody who got there before 2012 when and got into a residence, so whether it was a home, a condo, like something where you're going to get in, there's going to be some kind of rent control. You're, you're not going to be um, subject to what the market is doing. Um you're, you're, you're good because in 2012, there was like a housing bubble burst or whatever in Los Angeles and rent started going up, mortgages started going up. And so Chase and uh, Tabitha got there in 2000. And um, when she was describing how they went and got jobs at Macy's and answering and at a call uh, at a call center, I was like, what they paying at Macy's? But I assumed that, you know, back then, maybe you could have done that with your savings and a little bit of hourly you would have been able to um to make it work but nowadays i can't i can't see i can't see that happening i i don't know but i just know my rent was uh at the highest the highest the most i paid for rent was 1830 
Um, and I know that I have gone to, I had gone to some places that were near or close to where I worked and they were like, for one bedroom, it's going to be 2,300. So you tell me you work at Macy's and you can swing that. I, I don't know. I, 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 it helped me understand. But anyway, so yeah, they moved out there way before I did. So they had some different financial realities, but also, you know, she talked about how hard it was going out there with just them and how scary it was. And she really made me reflect on the fact that when I moved out to LA, I drove across the country for three days by myself, got out there, didn't know anybody. Um, I knew some people I'd gone to college with, but not well enough to say, hey, can I stay with you for two to three weeks while I look for an apartment? Um, I had never looked for an apartment in that city before because I didn't know what I was gonna be making when you, when you get hired by um, the district out there your salary is not your salary. You have to go through this salary review process. So I had no idea what I was going to be making. So I didn't want to sign a lease. Um, and I got out there and I found out that unlike in Texas, where a lot of you have a lot of corporately owned apartments in LA, it's a lot of privately owned. So it's a lot of, you know, footwork. It's a lot of going, looking at signs, you know, in the front of buildings, instead of just getting on a website, there are websites. Um, but it's just a little bit more in depth work that you had to do. And I didn't know anybody that I could be like, Hey, can I stay with you while I figure this out? So I had to stay in hotels, um, shout out to comfort Inn and suites in North Hollywood. They took care of me. Um, but that got really expensive. And there was one night where I ran out of money and I was in between my last paycheck. Like it was literally the span of 24 hours. I was in between my last paycheck from my job before I got there. I was waiting on my first paycheck from, um, the new district to hit. And I had, I was out of money and I call. And so I couldn't afford to stay in the hotel that night. I called my mom and I was like, can you send me anything? And she's like, I don't have any money. So I had to sleep in my car and I had to get up the next day. And, and people at work could kind of see. And remember, I worked at a school and I worked at a place where a lot of people um, owned homes or they owned property. So they didn't really know what the outside renting world was like. They had no idea. In fact, I asked one person when I first got there, where do people live uh, in this city? And he said, um, well... <laughs> we try not to be single. <laughs> and I was like, that's not what I asked you, jerk. I said, where do people live? Like, what can you? But I, but he didn't lie, though. It, it is cheaper to live with someone. But anyway, so I had to sleep in my car. I got up the next day. I went to work. And um, uh, yeah, she just, she reminded me of like how much more. And also another memory that uh, she reminded me of is when I first got to the campus, you know, I had just driven across country. I was like, okay, what, you know, what am I going to, I'm going to go into my new classroom. And I was used to schools that deep clean the carpets, painted the walls. But the school that I ended up at, I went into the classroom and um, the desks, and they were these big tables. They were thrown all over the room. Nothing was organized. Um, there were cobwebs everywhere. They had not mopped the floor. They had not swept. The boards were covered. It. So I walk in the room and I'm just like, oh my God, I've got to do this all. The first day of school is tomorrow. And I did it. And one of my coworkers was noticing me carrying things in from my car, like school supplies and stuff. And he goes, wow, you know, I remember this. I remember having to move into my classroom. You know, it's easier when you have a, a, a husband who can help you. And I just looked at him like, no shit. So she just reminded me of the fact that Number one, I'm amazing. And number two, yeah, man, when she's talking about having that partnership and that support um, to help you get through life, uh, it's, that's, that's gold. I have seen it happen. I've never experienced it, but I've seen it happen. And I know she knows what she's talking about because I identify with her experience as far as moving to a new place. And I know how hard it was for me because I was by myself. Um, so I can only imagine, um, how it would have been made that much easier if I had somebody who was looking out for me, which brings me to my last point. What if you never meet that person? So here's my thing. Wendy Williams is bruised and hurt and she's had some terrible relationships, right? And she's holding on to that bitterness and she needs to let it go because bitterness is like a disease. It gets into your bones and um, it, it, it slowly kills you from the inside out. So she needs to let that go. And um, if I was to give her advice on that, which she'll never see this, so she won't care. Um, but in case anybody needs to know what I personally did to let things go, I had to forgive myself 
for being in situations that didn't serve me. Um, I had to, you know, I, I remember getting into my very first relationship and it was an abusive relationship. And I remember once it ended feeling so much shame, like I'm Reggie's daughter, you know, um, I grew like, I know who I, how did I, how, how did this, what? Just feeling so much shame and also internalizing a lot of the things that were said to me by the other person in this relationship. Um, it took me a while to shake that off of me. And a big part of that was I just held so much shame. I did this to myself was, was my, um, was my belief. And I just started to kind of look around at the world and say, you know, we never blame people when they get the flu. You know, we're never like, oh, well, of course you can say, well, you were out there, you know, with no jacket on and this and that. But a lot of times we generally tend to accept that because we're human beings and it's flu season, there's always a risk that even without doing anything necessarily to bring it on ourselves, we can experience this communicable disease. And a lot of times I think about the fact that when people are seeking out relationships, um, you can be the strongest person in the world and run into somebody that's incredibly broken. And for whatever reason, y'all connect and their brokenness spreads to you. You can be, um, you can have all of the sense in the world and run into something and be knocked senseless. Just by measure of living life and the fact that we can't always control who comes into our sphere. And sometimes we don't have enough experience to ask the right questions to be able to discern who it is, right? So terrible things, terrible things can happen. And it's not your fault. Some of it can be, but all of it, no. And so a big part of me forgiving myself and letting go of bitterness was just realizing this, was, this wasn't, this wasn't your fault. You're not a terrible person inherently because a terrible situation found you. You need to forgive yourself for being in that situation. And you need to understand that you didn't do anything to deserve it. You never deserved that. You never deserved that. The situation was wrong, but it doesn't mean you're wrong. The situation was bad, but it doesn't mean you're bad. And because we can accept that those two things are separate, we can also accept that that situation was bad, but it doesn't mean that all situations that mirror that are going to be bad. And the other thing I would say is that the advice that Tabitha gave as far as, Wendy, I hope that you experience this kind of love. I hope that this kind of love finds you. Like I said earlier, um, what if it doesn't? Is she supposed to stay broken forever? And while I know that Tabitha was saying that because Wendy's wound, her core wound was in that spot, right? Um, and so a lot of times we think and we hope oh, well, since you were hurt like that, you'll heal that way. But I can remember so many times waiting for that kind of closure or like I was really, really hurt by someone. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'm just waiting on that next person to come in and just really, really show me and just, just be there. But they don't come and years pass. Am I supposed to stay broken and mangled? How do I move forward? And then I realized the love that Tabitha is talking about Wendy finding from a partner, I have always had it for myself, always. Even in situations where I have, I look back and I'm like, girl, you have been in some dark stuff. What kept you? What reminded you of who you were? What made you walk out? What made you say, who these dusts are throwing all over this room? But you know what? Them kids not going to come in here tomorrow and catch me half step and catch me not doing my job. Organize it. Clean the floor. Get those cobwebs from the walls. Go back to that hotel. Take a nice hot shower. Go to sleep. Come back here tomorrow. What is that? What drives that? Because it wasn't no partner. Wasn't nobody waiting for me at the hotel. Girl, I know it was hard out there. The world is hard, but I got your back. Nobody had my back. Nobody cared. But me. So the thing I would say to anybody um, is that instead of hoping or instead of waiting for a love that completely knocks you off your feet and, you know, erases the memory and redefines the situation, although I think all those things are super helpful, sometimes... 
you've got to remember who was there on, on, on day one and who gonna be there if that person goes, if they decide to stay, who's, who's going to be there regardless, who you have to sit with, which is yourself. And I, I don't know about, about you watching, I don't know about Wendy, but I've always had Stephanie, regardless. That unconditional, that patient, that kind, man, I have had, I've had my back. And at the end, I, you know, I think about it sometimes and I'm like, you know, at me personally, I don't think everybody is going to experience the kind of love that Chase and Tabitha have. In fact, I think what they have is rare and I think it's a gift and I think it's here to, their, their kind of love is here to teach us what things can look like as an example. And I feel that way with all people who have been exorbitantly blessed. I feel that way about people who have ex extensive wealth. They're here to teach us how to manage that resource. I feel that way with people who have you know, um, extensive intelligence. They're here to tell us how to manage that resource. I feel like anybody, you know, like they say, to whom much is given, um, much is expected. Well, I would, they say much is tested, but I say to whom much is given, much is expected, right? And so you you look at that and it's this bright star and it's this bright light and it's it's there to teach us how things can be. However, just because that's how things can be, it doesn't mean that's how they will be for everyone. And just like you have extremes in one situation, I think people experience extremes in other situations and it all adds to the tapestry of life. But that being said, I do not believe that every person, no matter how many times you get married, how many relationships you get in, that every person will experience the love that Tabitha and Chase have experienced. Um, and that's okay. Because I think about it and I'm like, you know, at the end of my life, there probably won't be anybody who's like, oh, she was the, she was the love of my life. Oh, no. Oh, she was the hell. But um, I definitely, till till the end, will be looking at myself in the eye. You know, we, we got this. We're, where are we going next? What are we doing next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was rough. Let's brush it off. We... And I think that that's also so important. So that's the advice that I would have given Wendy. Let go of the bitterness. Forgive yourself. And remember, all that unconditional love that patience that kind you 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 have permission to feel that for yourself first without anybody else ever coming to the station and once you do if you love yourself unconditionally you forgive yourself unconditionally even for things that you may have had a hand and letting happen to you you can let it go but yeah, so that is what I would say, and that is how I differ there. I love Tab. Please don't throw avocados all over my Instagram and my comment section. I love her, and I will keep watching her until the day her vegan carrot bacon turns back into pork. So then that's forever, because she is a vegan, um, and uh, I don't know, maybe one day I'll be one. She's definitely given us enough recipes for it, right? Thanks for watching.